are listening to Christian America Ministries Worldwide, a weekly shortwave radio program and online podcast dedicated to uncensored, politically incorrect biblical teaching. To learn more about Christian America Ministries, visit our website, ChristianAmericaMinistries.org. And now the broadcast. This morning, I'm going to be talking about something that everyone in America needs today. And I I have no doubt everyone here needs a little bit more of it as well, and you'll understand when I get along. Let's turn to Psalms 95, verse 2. It says here, And let us come before His presence with thanksgiving, and make a joyful noise unto Him with psalms. And I think we did that this morning. But we, but we need to do it every morning, every, every day, every, every bit of time that God has given us on this earth. And today in America, I think we need Thanksgiving more than anything else. And I'm not talking about the holiday on Thursday. But I'm talking about the, the spirit of Thanksgiving, the attitude of Thanksgiving that... We need to glorify and be thankful unto God for everything that he's given us. Uh, The grace and mercy that extends us every single day, the, just our lives, just being here. And then all the material things that we have that we overlook a lot of times. And America, Americans, our people, are probably some of the most unthankful people in the world. Uh, I mean... We we grumble and over some of the stupidest things, yeah. and are unthankful for about everything that we have yeah. as a whole as a people. And I don't think we would disagree with the majority of Americans feeling that way, being that way, especially people my age, all all ages. But you know, people my age, the younger people are some of the worst, because they were taught by their parents and their grandparents and then the system, and they've been indoctrinated with television and radio and so many different outlets. But we have a lot to be thankful for, and we have a lot of examples to look for back in history and in the scriptures of how to be thankful and what to be thankful for. And if you go to a restaurant at any point in time, you can... It's a rarity to see someone pray over their food and thank for the food that sits before them. There will be hundreds of thousands of people that sit down and eat Thanksgiving dinner on Thursday and don't even think twice about it. And that's sad. And, and we don't need to be gleeful in it like we, we're better because we need to guard ourselves for not to fall into that ourselves. Because it's easy to be unthankful and not even know you're being unthankful. And because as a people, we've been so blessed, it's, it's easy to forget all those blessings that we have that we take for granted every day. And we need to be an example to our brethren for that. And, uh, you know, it, it, when you go to a restaurant and somebody doesn't pray over their food, one thing, you, you need to make sure you're being seen praying over your food because they'll remember that. It stands out. I know that it does for me because you don't see it very often. So... That Psalms 95, that word, their thanksgiving, that is said. Now, some may think that thanksgiving, that word thanksgiving, can mean just any thanksgiving to anybody. But, and it can. But in the, Psalm, in the Psalms 95, verse 2, this word here means praise unto God. It means to give thanks unto God. It's not talking about thanksgiving to just anybody. It's talking about thanksgiving unto God Almighty, Amen. the Creator, our, our preserver, our deliverer, our defender. So that word thanksgiving, it's a Christian word. So when you hear somebody say it, it, it is a Christian word through and through. And it is to be used as such. And so many times... You know, as a father, 
when you when you give something to your children, and they're thankful for it. You know, they, they and sometimes you'll buy. I'll, I'll go to the store and I'll buy something and I'll give it to them just because I want to. I want to see that light up in their eyes. Amen. And and they're very thankful for it, very appreciative of it, and excited. And often, many times, we don't think about when our heavenly Father gives us something about how He feels feels feelings when we cast it to the side and, and treat it like garbage. And I know how it would make me feel as a father if my child did that, and we should, you know, those that are parents, use that as an example of how our Heavenly Father feels. And sometimes it's hard for us to understand that God has feelings. Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of odd. It's kind of something that we don't think about much, but he does have feelings. You read the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, there's feelings, how he feels, what he, what he is going through, what the love he has for his people, the grace and mercy that he has for his people. Those are feelings. Those are emotions. And, you know, he's given us life experiences as fathers, children, Grandmothers, grandfathers, just people, individual, however you want to put it, different scenarios of how we can help understand where he's coming from in many different areas. And it's something that we need to think about. How does God feel when we do something? Are we doing something that's going to make him feel happy? Like a little child looking up to his father or mother, and they look up for approval. Mm-hmm. And what I'm doing, is it, make, is it making you happy? Is it going to please you? We need to do that. And one way we can do that is thanksgiving. Yeah. The spirit of thanksgiving in our hearts. And we can do that in so many different ways. And we have so much to be thankful for. Like I said, we have our grace, our mercy. You know, we, we live in a sinful, wicked state. Amen. And many people don't think about that. Yeah. You know, they overlook it, but when you, (laughs) I know for me, when I mess up, you know, whether it be being unthankful or any sin in general, I'm very appreciative and thankful for the grace and mercy and the patience that he's given me. Today in America, faith, lack of faith is one thing that we, we, he's had a lot of patience with our people with. And each and every one of us, because I'm sure all of us have struggled with faith. I don't know anybody that hadn't. And we need to be on guard for that. But when we as a people run around in fear, which is the opposite of faith, we are looking at God and saying, hey, you're a liar. All those promises that you've given us, like we read in 91st Psalm this morning, those promises don't apply to me. You said they did, but I don't believe that you that they do. And when we look upon him in that way, how does you think? How do you think that makes him feel? It's not being very thankful, is it? When when he's promised us aspects and things, and he says this is going to happen, and it happens, and then later on down the road we, we question him again and again and again, and we lose that spirit of thanksgiving and that because we've replaced it with fear and doubt and ungratefulness. And we can look back in Scripture many times where our people have done this and we get to see how it makes him feel. For example, the Israelites, when they were in Egypt and they were brought out of bondage, and then as soon as they got out of bondage, just like our people, they scoffed and rebelled. And I wanted to go back to Egypt. Yeah. After seeing the plagues, yeah. can you imagine seeing the plagues? Yeah. The hearing the screams mm-hmm. that night. Mm-hmm. Then the next morning getting up, the smell of death. And then and then getting let out of one of the, the biggest superpowers in the world mm-hmm. out and delivered. And then you a few days later, you're ready to go back. How do you think that made him feel? Mm-hmm. Much worse than me giving a child a toy and them not liking it. I mean, talking about deliverance, promised deliverance. Yeah. 
all the way back with the Abrahamic covenant. And he showed Abraham the things that were going to happen in his prom- promised deliverance. The things that he did with Joseph. That was all setting up what he was going to do. And just the mere witnessing of those events, and it's, it's, it's astounding that our people could be so foolish to, to, to not be grateful and want to go back to what they had, which was bondage, slavery, torment. And later on at Mount Sinai, how did, they, how did God feel when he, he married them? They said, I do. And they're at the mountain, and then Moses is up there, and they craft a golden calf and betray him. They're at the Red Sea. I mean, these are the people that saw the sea part. They were ungrateful. They were not very thankful. There was no thanksgiving in their heart. Now, like I said, I know it's hard for us to understand where God is in his feeling, in his heart. But we actually have the word. There's so much here that tells us about how he feels towards us as a people. And it's not unlike a father and children, as we all know. And the act of being unthankful is one that I know that doesn't make him feel very good. We all understand that. And that spirit of thanksgiving is something that we as a people need more now in America than ever before. We need thanksgiving in our hearts like Habakkuk. Let's turn there. Habakkuk chapter 3. Right before Zephaniah, Zechariah, Malachi. Chapter 3. Now Habakkuk had a... He had a spirit of thanksgiving. He knew who fed him. He knew who was his deliverer, his master. And let's look in verse 17. Verse 17. Now think about this verse when you read it in relation to how people are acting today with all the everything going on. The food shortages, the you know, the vaccine mandates, the you know, just everything. Turn on the news. They'll give you plenty of reasons to <laughs> to wonder what, what God's doing. But in verse 17, it says here, this is how he's feeling. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, and labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet, listen, yeah. yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will joy in the God of my salvation. When we worry about everything under the sun today, we don't have a spirit like that. You know, yes, bad things happen. There's food shortages. There's, there's bad things that go on. There's going to be things that we have challenges in life. That's just normal. Our people have been doing it for a very long time. But the, the, the key is, is we cannot prevail over anything unless we have God first. And that word salvation there, that's not just talking about the afterlife. That's deliverance, like the 91st Psalm is talking about. That is deliverance from all those who hate us, the enemies of Christ. And Habakkuk understood that. He knew that, you know, even though the, my garden doesn't come in, there's food shortages, there's this, there's that, things go wrong. He knew who was the master. He knew who his deliverer was, and he knew serving him and being joyful for what he was going to give him was the number one priority, having thanksgiving. But today, so many of our people, like I said, worry about everything under the sun. Food shortages, vaccine mandates, FEMA camps, black helicopters, Pharaoh's army, it's all the same. (laughs) Habakkuk knew where his priorities were. He knew where everything came from. And we need to know and be reminded of where everything came from. And we need to know that he is our deliverer. He is our, our provider. And I like that word provider because he is our provider. He feeds all the birds, but he still feeds us too. And 
so many of our people don't, we don't think about a meal when we sit down to eat it in that aspect. Why? Because we've been so blessed we haven't had to think about it. I mean, we haven't. In fact, here in America, we have an abundance of food. And then if there's a toilet paper shortage, everyone goes nuts. It's funny, but people were, you know, why is that? I mean, that is not what we need to worry about. But so why was Habakkuk this way? Why did he feel this way? Why was he freaking out with a lot of the other people in the world? You know, oh no, the figs didn't come in. Why? 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 Because he knew his strength was in God. And he knew that God, no matter what he did, good or bad, what he was doing was truly, truly for his best interest. Now, it may not be easy. It may be hard, but it was for his best interest. And we can see that truth in Romans chapter 8, verse 23. You go ahead and turn there, which is a scripture, if you think about it, it applies to Christians. It applies to Christians. Now, it doesn't apply to non-Christians. So if you're not a Christian, then we have, you have big issues and big reasons not to feel this way. But we as Christians can understand and be thankful and hopeful to live without fear and doubt because of these promises. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And it says here, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. Do you all love God? Amen. Are we called according to His purpose? Amen. Then we have nothing to worry about. Hallelujah. When we go through trial, and that's not saying trials aren't hard. They are. Yes. But we can call upon Him to help us bear them. And when we don't call upon Him, we don't even think about Him, we don't even put Him into the equation, what is it, where do we end up? Well, do we truly love God, and are we called according to His purpose when we're messing up that bad? He's our deliverer, like in the Psalms. He's our bulwark, our shield. He's like a, like a hen covering his little chicks. He, he protects us, and we have to believe and have faith in Him and know that. And we need to live in this promise made by God. And this is one of many promises that He has made our people, made Christians, that we can look to and see fulfillment in it. But so many times today, our people have an attitude of they don't believe the promises, any promise. No matter, no matter what it is, they find ways of not believing it. Let's turn to another passage, Job chapter 2, verse 20. Now, Job, he has a lot to grumble about, don't you think? He, he went through a lot. Nothing that I want to go through, and I don't think anything that you all want to go through. But his attitude says everything about his, his spiritual life, his thanksgiving. And he... He had a lot to grumble for. I mean, think about today an average American going through what Job went through. Uh, <laughs> he would do exactly what Job didn't do. Let's read it here. Verse 20 it says here, Then said unto his wife, uh, then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil, or excuse me, receive evil? Which means bad, by the way. And all this did not Job sin with his lips. So everything that went Job went through, he still knew, hey, I've received good and I've received bad from God. But he still had faith. And if we read the entire story of Job, we know that he didn't die in despair and unfaithfulness and unthankfulness, did he? No. He came out on top. We need men and women today that have this spirit of thankfulness in America. Amen. It's a key. If you think about it today with everything going on, if any one aspect, if we were more thankful, we'd have more faith, We'd have 
better understanding of God's grace? Because we would be acknowledging God. Thankfulness is an acknowledgement of God, period. Because if you're not thankful, you're not acknowledging there's a God to begin with. Um, that's one reason today in America, on Thursday, the holiday Thanksgiving, so many people today like to call it Turkey Day. Well, why do you think they don't do that? Because it's scoffing and erasing the acknowledgement of God and the thanksgiving of God. That's very wrong. Shameful. Amen. And all throughout the scriptures, it teaches us to be thankful and understanding. I want to read a few scriptures before I move on about Thanksgiving. They're on the psalm. And that's not by coincidence, because like you said this morning, it's a hymnal. It's the, or Pastor Jennings did. The, uh, it's the Israelites' hymnal. It's what they used. That's what they sang. And Thanksgiving, like I said, the word is singing praise to God, thank, thanking Him for it. So let's read a couple of them. Uh, 26, Psalm 26, verse 7. To get an, just an aspect of a couple things, a way we can look at Thanksgiving. It says here, That I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving. Publish. Think about that for just a second. Distribute. Make known. Publish with the voice of thanksgiving. And tell of all thy wondrous works. Did Job tell of all the wondrous works of God? He did, even the bad ones that he had to go through. He was thankful even for those. Psalms 50, verse 14. 50, verse 14. And it says here, Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High. That's an interesting word, offer. We offer up thanksgiving unto God. Much like when someone gives you something, what do you do? You say, well, thank you. Well, you offer. You don't have to. What happens if you don't say thank you when someone gives you something? Well, yeah, yeah. You know, ungrateful. You know, I'll, I won't do that again. <laughs> How many times have you heard that? <laughs> well, that's the last time I'm giving him something. He didn't even say thank you. <laughs> but God's not that way, is he? He has a lot of more grace and mercy in that aspect. But that doesn't make it right. That just gives you an example of how we're not very merciful and grateful and are merciful to our brethren. Sure. You know, he didn't say thank you that one time 25 years ago when I handed him whatever. Yeah. Unfortunately, I have heard grown men yeah. say that to other grown men. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my goodness. How do you, how do you remember? <laughs> yes. But people do. But we need to offer it. Offer thanksgiving. And pay thy vows unto the Most High. We're paying it to Him. And we, He grants us a lot, and there is nothing that we can give Him to pay for it. Amen. There's nothing. Amen. It's too much. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have nothing to offer Him. Amen. We're just a speck of dirt Amen. compared to Hallelujah. what He has given us. Yes. But the very littlest thing we can do is be thankful for it. Amen. The very smallest thing. Psalms 6930. 30. And it says here, And I will praise the name of God with a song. How often do we praise Him with a song? Well, we, we do it often. Do we do it every day, though? Do we do it or just once a week? We need to praise Him with a song. And we'll magnify Him with thanksgiving. But well, we know thanksgiving means to praise God, make Him be uh, understand our thankfulness, be thankful to God. That's what we need to do as a people. One last one in the book of Psalms. Uh, 147, verse 7. And it says here, Sing unto the Lord. With thanksgiving, sing praise upon the harp unto our God. So now it's just not singing with your voice, but it's, you use an instrument too. Amen. Praise Him. Yes. So Christians today, we need more thanksgiving in our heart. Every every bit of it. We need more of an attitude of thanksgiving. 
And this Thursday, very few will have it, unfortunately. But that doesn't mean that we can't. You know, when we go over to a family's house this Thursday, make sure that we have a spirit of thanksgiving. Amen. That way they may look upon our example and let our glory, what little we have, shine, His glory shine through us and be an example. And many people will sit down and, and eat and not even think about what they're putting in their mouth. And we're going to talk about it here in a minute about how thankful we should be. And I'm going to tell a story uh, that many of you probably heard of our forefathers and their thankfulness. We've got a lot to learn. But Thursday on Thanksgiving Day, it isn't what we call a biblical holiday, but it's a Christian holiday. It's something that has Christian roots. It has Christian heritage roots. Our, our forefathers took part in a, a part of that. And many times people don't even know what, what we're talking about. Like I said, they disgrace it by calling it Turkey Day. Now, for those that don't know of this Christian heritage, we're going to talk about it right now. But because the early Christian Christians in America in the 1600s, they, they looked at Thanksgiving with a totally different aspect than we do today. Because they were much farther along in our walk in many areas than we are today. Most people believe that the, the pilgrims that came over here in the 1600s and the holiday of Thanksgiving was started to give Thanksgiving only to the Indians. That's, that's not exactly, if you read the story, that's not exactly what was happening. Yes, they were involved in it, but it was giving Thanksgiving unto God for their deliverance. The, their the deliverance from when they left Holland all the way over here to America and then everything that happened. So much rich history there of everything that they went through. And we're going to go over it a little bit today. But they were giving thanksgiving to God for their deliverance, their being able to be fed and live and, and not die at the hands of cold weather, starvation, you know, all the different perils that they had. And their story starts all the way back in England. And they were part of the Church of England. And they, they wanted to leave the Church of England. They, they, they saw the writing on the wall, so to speak, and they wanted to, to get out and flourish beyond that and do what they saw God wanted them to do in the Word. So what they did, they separated themselves. They separated themselves, and they received heavy persecution for it. Heavy persecution. And it, it would have been real easy to cave Okay, I'll go back. I'll do whatever you want. Me and my children will go back and, and we'll participate in things that we know are wrong, but we'll do it anyway because it's just, it's just more convenient, more uncomfortable. They're more comfortable. But they didn't. They packed up and they moved to Holland. And Holland was not bad. The conditions were not bad. They weren't being persecuted like they were in England. But they found out that their children were becoming Hollandized, so to speak. They were becoming like the Holland people. And they, they loved their heritage enough that they, they wanted to preserve it. And they did. So they decided to, to rent a boat, two boats actually. And one of them was the Speedwell, and one of them was the Mayflower. And they wanted to go to the New World, what they thought was an, an opening for them. And many people don't know about the Speedwell, and I'll tell you about that here in a minute. But these Christians here, and we can look at their, their old documents and understand where they were and how they felt about the law of God and the king of God and where they put him, on, where they put him in, in the rank of everything else in the world. This is just one example. This is the Portsmouth, Rhode Island Compact. And there's dozens of examples just like this. This is not one. It was written in 1638. It says here, quote, we whose names are underwritten do hereby solemnly in the presence of Jehovah incorporate ourselves into a body politic. And as we, excuse me, and as he, God, shall help, will submit our persons, lives, estates unto our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and to all those perfect and most absolute laws of his given in his holy word of truth to be guided and judged thereby, end quote. 
Where have we gone today? What, how far have we fallen from the, 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 the attitude these people had? Amen. That I, I don't care what man says. We're going to do what God says. And many people think we can't go back to this mindset of no king but King Jesus. But we can. There's nothing stopping us. Because who can be against us when we have God for us? But they acted on this, this faith. They act upon it and they, they rented two boats, the Speedwell and the Mayflower. And the reason the Speedwell wasn't very well known is it, had, it was leaky. They got in it and it had a leak. Some people say it was sabotaged by the, 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 the sailors. They don't know for sure. And they had to stop off and they loaded everything on the Mayflower. So they had two ships which were packed. And they stopped off, and they got rid of the speed well, and they crammed everything, and there were some people left behind. But the Lord obviously wanted a certain group of people to go. I don't know who was left behind, but they, they all ended up piling in the Mayflower. There were 102 passengers, 30 crew members, in living quarters. So they had the ship, and then they had the living quarters, which is a big room underneath and they had the ship, which was eight, the living quarters, which was 80 feet by 20 feet by 5 feet. 102 people, all in that room. Think about that. It was dark. Five foot ceilings. I'm about six foot, so that's not that far. They're crouching. Three months. Three months. Because they felt the need, and they had faith. To, to separate themselves from persecution so they could practice Christianity the way that they understood that it was correct, which was by the word and not by traditions of man. So they were in this room for three whole months. It was dark. They had one lantern to light it. All the hatches had to be shut at all times because it was so stormy they couldn't open them for much longer. Water would flow in there. Think about the children crying. It's just men, women, children, whole family. The children crying. No cooked meals for three months. No privacy at all. And the smell. Can you all imagine the smell? Now, that's something we don't want to think about, but 102 people in a room like that, it smelled. Now, this is what these people went through. And one man, one man, he, the crew wouldn't let the the pilgrims come out of their, their, their hole they were in, basically. And, because they couldn't, because the storms were so, you get washed off. And one man, he had enough. He, the smell was just unbearable. And he opened the hatch, and he looked around, and there was walls of water everywhere. And he got swept away. But he didn't die by, by a miracle. He grabbed a hold of a rope, and they pulled him up. Now, this is in the North Atlantic in the winter. They pull him up, and he's blue. He didn't die, though, but he didn't stick his head out for, until they got home. <laughs> but think about that. They only had two deaths, and uh, none of them were the pilgrims. One of them, though, was a man who, one of the crew members, which most of the crew, I would say, if not all of them, were not Christians. They may have been uh, by the end of all this. I don't know. But uh, one of them was very... Um, venomous towards the pilgrims. He was not in favor of anything they had to do. And he made fun of them being seasick and would look at them and you know, make jokes about, you know, oh, I, I can't wait to throw you overboard and feed you to the fishes. You know. Well, guess who the per first person that caught fever and died? It was him. <laughs> and that mysterious illness nobody else caught. But there was another man of the crew that died as well. And none of them being pilgrims. The pilgrims had no deaths, but they did have something else happen to them. They had one birth on board. <laughs> now think about that for a minute. Talk about faith. That man, a husband and wife, they got on that, bo that, that boat knowing, you know, she's seven, eight months pregnant, knowing without a doubt that that baby is going to be born on board of that little cramped ship. Think about the faith that 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 took place there. Now, I've got three children, and I, I was at the birth of all three of them. And 
I wouldn't want to experience that on a on a rocky, leaky, smelly boat with a hundred and hundred people there. That would not be very good conditions. Think about the faith that the woman that got on there with a, knowing that her baby is going to be born on that ship, but everything was fine. But think about the faith when we think about how un, how ungrateful we are about this, that, or whatever about the conditions. Think about that. It's just it, it's it's mind boggling. It really is. Well, they arrived three months, long, long trip. I mean, un, unimaginable. They arrived on November nineteenth, sixteen twenty, and they uh, they stopped at Cape Cod, and then they they ended up going to uh, Plymouth Rock. And the moment the Pilgrims stepped on land, William Bradford, which was the governor, he he wrote in his book what happened, and this is what he said. Quote, being thus arrived in a good harbor and brought safe to land, they fell upon their knees yeah. and blessed the God of heaven yeah. who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean and delivered them from all the perils and miseries thereof and again to set their feet on the firm and stable earth, their proper element. <laughs> now, those words there, you got to, they're being written by a man that spent three months in a boat with 102 people in an 80 by 20 by 5 foot space. Guess what scripture he read right after that? Psalms 100. Let's turn there. <laughs> this is what they read as soon as they got on land. Now think about this. When you read it, think about that it's being read by people that spent three months in a boat. They saw death, sickness, you know, they, all the things that they went through. This is what they read when they got on the shore. Quote, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord in all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with singing. And know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and we know ourselves, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise and be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Think about that. Those words and hearing them. How sobering is that for us today when we read about the things that they went through, and this is just one group of people. There's all kinds of people we can look back through history in Scripture and in history and understand and see their trials that they went through. But how sobering it is to hear this. Yet these Christians took a leap of faith, a big leap, all across the Atlantic, a leap of faith to do what? Not to search for gold, not to get riches, but to advance the kingdom of God in the here and now on earth in their lifetimes. And here it is, however many hundreds of years later, and we're still looking at their examples, wondering how they did it. Yet we have more than physically than they ever did. It's just, it's mind-boggling. The cold, wet ride, and they knew nothing about the land when they got there. They didn't know how to farm it. They were out of place. They were in a, on another planet as far as they, they were concerned. Uh, their skills and being able to operate. It wasn't long after they arrived before the pilgrims started to die. And we can speculate on why they died. Maybe because God wanted to take this story, this event, and glorify it. Because we're going to see here in a minute how he does. Now, just like with the Egyptians and the, the Israelites in Egyptian captivity, if they had never went into bondage, how glorious would have been the Exodus? Amen. Would we have had anything to look to and see? Would there have been a Red Sea deliverance? And we can look today around us, and we can see how bad things are, but how glorious will they be when God delivers us from the, these things? And also where... We can stand up as men, Christian men of God, and follow the things that God set forth in His Word and glorify Him that way as well. 
if we don't go through trials and and things like that, we could never have that opportunity. And it'd be rather boring too. <laughs> but unfortunately, the the pilgrims started to die after they went there. In December, six of them died. January eight, February seventeen, and in March thirteen. That's a lot of people when there's only 102. When all was said and done in end of March, nearly almost half of all the people that had journeyed there were dead. 47 people. Of all the people, 13 out of 18 wives were dead. Out of 13 sons, 3 were dead. Out of 102 people, only 3 families were unbroken. Think about that. And then think about, and we're going to read about it here in a minute, their thankfulness, their attitude yes. of going through that. I mean, can you imagine being a group of 102 people and only having three families that are not broken? 13 out of 18 wives in a colony that was supposed to, you know, have children and produce, be dead? But these people, they remained faithful. They, they believed what, they believed the word, and they believed, and that you can look by their actions of what they believed. Bradford, in his in his book, he pointed out that the highlight of the Pilgrims' Week, this is during the the death, the hard. This isn't the this isn't the high point. The highlight of their week was going to worship service. Now think about that too, when you when you know. Here in America, we have a hard time filling up a church for a worship service. Yeah. Now, we can fill up the big entertainment halls and the stadiums and stuff, for, yeah. and even some of the ones they call churches. <laughs> but think about these people, what they went through. Yeah. And here in America, our, our ideas, our, our way of viewing things, how a lot of people would, I'm not going to church. I'm not going to go worship God and glorify Him, sing praises to Him. No, I'm not going to do that. But they weren't reading the book of Psalms. These people were, though. They understood. So the highlight of their week was going to worship service. And they went there to glorify God. And it's just amazing. After March, things started to change. Things started to get a little better for them, too. The winter started to let up, started to warm up a little bit up in New England, and they, they started to prosper a little bit. They still didn't know anything about the land. Now, <laughs> they, they were all hurl, uh, gathered around in, in what the, one of the buildings that they had built, and they were very careful with their dead because when they would bury the, their dead, they would, uh, they would do it at night. That way some of the Indians wouldn't know how many had died. Can you imagine 100 people? You know, there were some Indians that were not very friendly. There were some friendly ones, but can you imagine that what it was like knowing that half of you are, are dead? I mean, easy pickings. Well, in March things started to get better, and they they sounded the alarm and they said one an Indian is coming, not Indians, an Indian one. And it's probably one of the funniest stories in this portion of history because he walked up. And they, he greeted them, and he said, Welcome. Have you got any beer? <laughs> In perfect English. Wow. Perfect English. Oh. Can you imagine that? Now, you've got to realize these people are in the middle of nowhere. They're, they're in an Englishman for a long time. And then an Indian walks up and says, Welcome. Do you have any beer? Probably said it better than I said it right there. Can you? I, I'd love to see their face because you know that was amazing. Now, that's a miracle in itself if you think about it. Yeah. Well, the Indian's name was Samson, and he, uh, he, was, he liked English food, and he liked beer, and he traveled around. He had learned English with traders, and that's, that's how he did. He had a taste for English food, and he enjoyed it. So first thing, he was going <laughs> to—it's kind of funny because, they, they, of course, they fed him, you know, and, and, and talked to him and wanted to get information about the land and— uh, you know, they put a watch on him and you know at night because they didn't know what this guy well, he ate piled up in the corner and went to sleep. <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, the next morning he left, and he, uh, he come back with uh, one that you probably heard. His name's Squanto. He also knew English. Now, Squanto's a very interesting story, um, one that God obviously had his hand in that for the reasons that we're going to talk about. But Squanto was a member of the tribe that once lived on the area that the pilgrims had landed on. And when the pilgrims had arrived, that everything was cleared, it was an empty spot, and they had found ca- some caches of food, and uh, they, uh, it was kind of weird, you know, they get there, you know, in the wilderness and have this clear spot. Well, Squanto was the only surviving member of the tribe that was once there. Uh, it was four years prior to that. They had all died of a mysterious illness, and all the other tribes didn't want to get near it because they... They saw it as a bad spirit. I think they said a bad spirit had come in and, and, and taken them out. And I think the closest one was like 50 miles, so they didn't want to get near it. So it was, what are the odds of that? Going into a place where, you know, all the, you know, the ones that would do them harm were so far away. Then have the only surviving member of that tribe that, who knew the land, knew the area, knew English, show up. Well, Squanto, his... <laughs> that was no coincidence, by the way. I don't think anybody can... So Squanto was one of their biggest allies because he knew the language, he could communicate, he was a translator. But Squanto, the reason he had learned English is he had been captured into slavery by the English and hauled back to uh, England, and that was in 1605. So he'd been gone a while. And he had learned English, and... He was obviously sent by God to help the pilgrims in that area. Now, think about that. All the way to England and back, because he'd end up getting a ship back and being released, and then he'd come back and everybody was dead. Everyone he knew. But somehow he ended from going from Plymouth, Massachusetts, to England, learned English, lived for you know 15 years, and came back. Just amazing. You got to remember that's a that's a thir- three month trip, three months back. So six months of those fifteen years was in a boat. And there's much more we could say about him, but it was just because of time we can't. But the Pilgrims had a good summer that year. Squanto had ta- taught them how to plant corn. I know you all probably remember the story about putting the fish in the, the bottom where you co- plant the seed of corn, and you know the it fertilized the corn. And he taught them how to do things like that and hunt clams and different things to survive because they had no idea. And they started getting on track, and uh, Squanto and another tribe helped them, and they established trade, and they were had some trade going on. And Governor Bradburn declared a public day of Thanksgiving. After going through all this, and they had some food, a public day of Thanksgiving. And this is the one that we always remember, this one here. And they had invited the Indians to come, and they... They were a little nervous doing that because they didn't know if they were going to bring any food. And, but they, they did it on faith, and then they come, and I think they brought three or four deer and some wild turkey, and they had a, a feast, much like the ancient Israelites' f- feast of uh, the in-gathering. They had a, uh, a feast of in-gathering and thankfulness for what God had brought them through because the abundance of food they had now was just ast- astronomical compared to what they didn't have just a few months prior. But it was not to give thanks necessarily to the Indians, but to give thanks to God. Because he was the one that orchestrated all this. No man could orchestrate everything, what little I just told you. So they had a day of thanksgiving. It was a big feast to give thanks unto God. And they lifted up prayers to him the entire feast and for thanking them for their deliverance. After November, this is in November of the following year, it had been a whole year, it had been there a whole year, a full ship of people showed up, uh, colonists. They had no food, no clothes, no tools. They had made the journey on faith too, and they showed up with nothing. Now, they had stores of food at this point. The moment the colonists got on board, they went down to rations. Now, think about that. Now, God was obviously testing these people. They just had a, a day of thanksgiving unto him. And then more people show up. But you ought to remember, they had lost half of their people too. Yes. So they needed more people. Yes. You know, that's what a colony needs. Right. 
Every man, woman, and child had five kernels of corn, the rations for the winter. I don't know if I can imagine that. Every day, five kernels of corn. I don't know how anybody could survive on that. You know how many died of starvation? None. Which is amazing in itself. Five kernels of corn. Can you imagine the children? Mommy, I'm hungry. Daddy, I'm hungry. Knowing that, you know, even if you give them your food, with five, that's still isn't enough. But it was. They survived. And they still praise God for it. What is our excuse? We have not a one. In 1623, two years later, there was 12 weeks of drought. 12 weeks of drought. And their crops had pretty much dried up. It was looking pretty bad. They were desperate. So they gathered together as a people, and they fasted and prayed for eight hours straight. Eight hours straight. And... (laughs) The next day, rain started to gently fall on where they were, and it rained for 14 days straight. And the crops that they thought were were gone came back alive. Now, I I don't know about you, but I've tried to water dead plants, half dead, or what do you want to, and very rarely do they come back alive. I mean, it helps, but that plant's just never the same again. You know, there's only so much water can do. Amen. So that uh, the rain was a miracle, and then the fact that the crops came back alive, that's yeah. a miracle too. <laughs> After that, they had an abundance, a surplus. And can you imagine having nothing, you know, <laughs> praying and it raining and then everything coming back alive? Yeah. Thankfulness. So they, they celebrated Thanksgiving every year. Amen. It was a... It was a feast day that they had put in place to thank God for their personal deliverance in their situation. Thanksgiving 1623 was a very humbling one. They started a new tradition. They had an abundance of food, plenty of food. But before their meal, they placed five kernels of corn on everybody's plate (laughs) to remember where they were and where they are. Like, can you imagine? Kind of gives me goosebumps thinking about it. Yeah. The sobering feeling. Amen. Everybody around <laughs> looking down at them five kernels yeah. of corn. Right. Ah. Talk about the, the understanding of Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. And they never forgot. Can you imagine being, the, <laughs> being a child at that time? Remembering that your whole life? I mean, you never forget it. Looking down at a plate with only five kernels of corn and then seeing the miracles that happen afterwards. These are our people. Yes. And so easily we forget. Amen. So easily we forget. Hallelujah. But they did. There's so much more I could say. <laughs> if you want to learn, I'll tell you a good book to get. And some of you all may have read it already. The Light and the Glory. How many have read The Light and the Glory? Excellent book. Excellent book. Talks about the history uh, of what we're talking about here and much more in the miracles. The miracles that God performed on these faithful, praying Christians. And today, we we need that spirit today. We need that spirit of thanksgiving here in America today. We need the spirit of revival and faithfulness because we don't have it. Not the way we should. And Thanksgiving is just one thing that we can do. And we can start today. Because, like I had said at the beginning, we all need Thanksgiving in some way. I know I do. Because so many times I've caught myself not being thankful for something when I really, you know, really should have been. It's, it's hard to be thankful when you have so much sometimes. You know, you don't think about the roof over your head until it's not there. You don't think about the food on your, your plate until it's not there. And God tried these people. 
just like he's tried a lot of us and people in the scriptures and through history. And they learned what Thanksgiving was. Yeah. Now, I don't want to go through anything these people had to go through. We have their testimony to look to. Now, I would hate for us to get into a place in our heart where we'd have to go through something like this to have Thanksgiving right. in our heart. Praise to God. And we can be an example to others. When we see other people not being thankful for them, we can be the light that shineth in the world. We can be a light up on a hill and let them see what God has granted us and help them. But so often we're, we're gruff and unmerciful to our brethren. I think it was uh, George Southwick that once said that we need to be as patient with our brethren as Christ is with us. And someone told me he said that, and I, I can't get that quote out of my head ever since um, because it is so true because so many, so many times we're, we're ungrateful to our brethren. We're unmerciful to our brethren and helping them get along in our walk. So I hope that the words that I had today will instill in you to think about Thanksgiving this upcoming Thursday and every day every day of the week, and teach other people, teach our children, grandchildren, our brothers, our sisters, whoever, that we need to be thankful unto God for everything, no matter how bad that it is, because it's important. And as a father, a heavenly father, we want to be thankful for him, for everything that he's given us. So let's close in prayer and thank God for everything in our lives. And if you don't have anything to be thankful for, Pray to God for things to be thankful for because you just hadn't seen them yet. Let's bow our heads. Thank you for listening to Christian America Ministries Worldwide. The message you just finished listening to was titled, America Needs Thanksgiving. And I preached this message in November of 2021 at Rose Hill Covenant Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I thank you for listening to the broadcast this evening, and I apologize for not having a new broadcast, but I thought this older message was a good fit for this evening and for this week for us all to think about things that we need to be thankful for. If you're listening to us on shortwave radio, we'd love to hear from you. If you can go to our website, ChristianAmericaMinistries.org, and send us a reception report through our contact page, we would love to hear from you. And if you're one of our regular listeners, uh, come back next week for another broadcast. We broadcast on shortwave radio on WRMI on 9395 every Saturday at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. And if you want to know more about our broadcast and the things this ministry does, you can go to our website, once again, ChristianAmericanMinistries.org. And you can also listen to our weekly sermons and uh, these broadcasts podcast, and other things at our YouTube channel, Christian America Ministries on YouTube. I've been your host, Matthew Dyer, and thank you for listening, and come back next week for another broadcast. Thank you for listening to Christian America Ministries. If you are blessed by this outreach ministry, please consider going to www.christianamericaministries.org to our contact page and donating to our radio ministry to help keep this program on the air. We appreciate your support. You have been listening to Christian America Ministries Worldwide. Come back next week on shortwave radio or on the internet for our next broadcast. To learn more about Christian America Ministries, visit our website, ChristianAmericaMinistries.org. Thank you for listening.